And they believe that the group is more important than the individual, for example. And the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. They believe that the state should be all-powerful and that uh, the people should obey the state for the greater good of the greater number and all of that sort of thing. Um, they believe that rights are uh, granted by the state. They're not, uh, they're not part of the human being. They're not, they're not God-given. They're not entrenched in his body and soul. They have to be granted by the state. All of these things, and you look at them one by one, communists and fascists and Nazis and socialists, they all believe that. So wherein lies the conflict, you see? And I began to question that. And I realized that it's partly a trick. It's a, in fact, I think it's a huge trick. It's a great scam because people even today are thinking that they have to choose between the right or the left, not realizing that no matter which way they go, they've accepted basically the same ideology underneath. Now, it's true that the leaders of these groups like the, the Stalins of the world and the Adolf Hitlers of the world and the Mao Zedongs of the world and so forth, the, the leaders of these groups on left and right will fight each other and they will go to war with each other and there will be tremendous battles as we saw in World War II, for example. Uh, but what are they fighting over? Ideology? Not at all, because they agree on ideology. What they're fighting over is dominance. Who is going to rule? That's all they're fighting over. Not just any world government, but a world government based on the model of collectivism. In other words, big, powerful, centralized world government. If it were a world government based on the principles of freedom and uh, freedom of choice, freedom of culture, low intervention, if no intervention in the lives of normal human beings, it might be a wonderful thing, but that's not the kind of world government the left and the right have in mind. They're talking about total world government with all major decisions being made at the top and people at the bottom being essentially few, uh, in, living in a feudalist society, just serfs uh, and uh, peasants basically in a high-tech feudalism. And the left and the right both agree with that goal and so they never discuss it in public debate. Another tactic, isn't it, that the opposition knows that the American people, any people in the world, will gladly give up their liberty and their comforts if it's in their mind a means of gaining security, protection against a dreaded threat of some kind. That's why regimes that are struggling to hold the loyalty of their people are very dangerous regimes because instinctively they know they have to go to war. They know that in time of war the people will rally behind their leaders no matter what because we're at war. And if we lose this war, we'll be invaded, we'll be conquered by some dreaded enemy. And so throughout history, uh, governments that are weak or losing influence over their own people uh, traditionally start wars and or they manufacture uh, false flag operations against themselves. They create their own enemies. They, be, they want to be victims so that they can rally their citizens behind them and anybody who wants to continue criticizing these leaders is then branded as being unpatriotic or possibly even um, branded as a traitor. So it's an old ploy. It's been done throughout history. It's time for a fundamental change. And that's not going to happen, though, until more and more Americans, first of all, wake up to the reality of their present plight. They were still living in a dream world. Every time there's a crisis, every time there's a war, Every time there's a terrorist attack or every, if there's a banking crisis, no matter what the crisis is, this movement toward totalitarianism accelerates. And then it slows down until the next crisis comes along. They know that as people begin to lose their economic freedom and uh, they know that as one crisis after another uh, descends upon them, there's going to be opposition. And so they planned on this a long time ago. And I think um, what we're really looking at is, um, I think Alex Jones called it the end game. We're, we're approaching the end game, and they have a plan for that. And that is to, um, to institute martial law. Because as people become upset, they go into the streets, they demonstrate, and eventually they become unruly, eventually they become violent, and eventually they start breaking windows, eventually somebody gets hurt,
eventually somebody gets killed, eventually there's martial law, and that really is what they really want, because they want an excuse for martial law. All collectivist systems eventually deteriorate into a police state. Because but it certainly has way. gained momentum uh, through World War I, really got up to speed, and then finally in World War II, all of the major uh, players on the world scene were talking about world government. They tried to do the League of Nations, that failed. Finally, they created the United Nations, that stuck. And so now they're just trying to pump up the United Nations into the, the framework of the global government that they have always envisioned. Them, I'm sure they look at it as a, as a wonderful thing. They see it as um, an end of nationhood, as it has been historically defined. They see that as advantageous, they say, because it'll put an end to war and so forth. And, um, and they can sell the idea as a great step toward uh, brotherhood and a unified globe and so forth. They use all of these things to make it sound good. But when you start examining the actual policies that they're instituting, it's not so hot. It's based on the principle of collectivism, as I've said several times, and that means it's all powerful government. It's a tyrannical government. It's the same kind of a system that Adolf Hitler had in mind, and we fought a war to destroy him and his system. It's the same kind of a system that uh, Joseph Stalin had in mind, and we fought a Cold War and, and did a lot of other things to make sure that that didn't happen. The ca same kind of a system that Mao Zedong had in mind and uh, Benito Mussolini. All of the great collectivists of history have had this unified global government based on the model of collectivism as their goal, and we fought against it until recently now we are actually the greatest uh, advocates of it ourselves. We don't call it uh, tyranny. We don't call it fascism or Nazism or communism. We have a better name for it. The name they have chosen is the New World Order. That's their favorite phrase for it. But when you examine its nature and its essence, it is a collectivist system, powerful government, little people at the bottom taking orders. So this is the concept. It's been under evolution for over a hundred years. It looks like it's coming within sight now. Too much alarmed about it before it's too late. That has always been the, the strategy that they have followed. So that, that means they have to deny that it's happening. It means they have to uh, do it behind closed doors. That means they don't bring it up for a vote in Congress. They do it administratively rather than legislatively. And all of those strategies and tactics are being used. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? In my view, it's a very bad thing because I think collectivism is the, is the graveyard of civilization. It's certainly the graveyard of freedom. If you just think about it, no collectivist system in the world has ever uh, been the kind of a place where freedom was uh, prosperous. Uh, people always wound up in the gulag or some kind of a concentration camp if they disagreed with their their um, leaders. And the first step All in knowing what to do about it is knowing what not to do about it. And by that I mean what not to do about it is to fall for this left-right paradigm where both the right wing and the left wing are both pursuing this objective but fighting each other. And if we, if we get caught up in that trap we'll spend all of our time fighting the leftists are fighting the rightists and it doesn't make any difference because no matter which side you're on in that battle you still are promoting this globalist uh, government strategy. So the first thing to know is don't get trapped in this left-right paradigm. Good question, Next it? thing is... Uh, what is freedom? A lot of people think that freedom is merely not being in jail. That's their definition. If you're not in jail, you're free. It doesn't make any difference if you're not free to live where you want to live or hire who you want to live, hire or, or travel where you want to go or spend your money the way you want to spend it or write what you want to write or go on the internet and say what you want to say. They don't think that's important as long as you're not in jail. <laughs> they call that freedom. And we have the, um, the commandments of freedom, the things that thou shalt not do, for example. Very simple things, but all of the great movements of history have always started with simple concepts. The freedom movement in America and in the world right now is in very serious need of some simple concepts, some simple principles, some ideas that you can believe in. You know the old saying is if you don't believe in something you will fall for anything. It's very true. And so the first step toward reversing this 
drift toward global, collectivist, tyrannical government is to know what we believe in, what is freedom, and be able to define it, to be able to defend it, to be able to argue against the collectivists and say this system is better than that for this reason, this reason, and this reason. And then finally, the ultimate question is, well, who's going to do this? It's easy to become um, despondent, discouraged, and say, well, nobody cares. My, my neighbor is out cutting his grass. He's a good guy. We talk about baseball. We talk about the weather. We can talk about the latest movies. Um, but he doesn't want to talk about politics. He doesn't care about the economy. He just doesn't want to become informed. And he certainly doesn't want to take any personal responsibility for monitoring and, and changing the system. So how are, you going to, how are you going to fight this great drift toward global government with all of these powerful people at the top and nobody on the street cares? And the answer is that all movements of history have always been determined by less than 3% of the population. You don't need everybody out there. In fact, uh, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. Never happened before in history and it won't happen now and certainly won't happen in the future. 3% or less of the population are always the movers and the shakers. If you can reach 3% of the people who really care and who really have the mindset and who are willing to make the sacrifices and the dedication to this task, it can be done. And the guy next door will continue to push his lawnmower and he'll go whichever way the system goes. It's always been that way. So we don't need to be discouraged by the fact that not everybody is taking an interest. Our job is to find that one, two, or three percent of the people who do care, get the message to them, join forces with them, and then we have to come to power. Coming to power means we have to get into politics, we have to get back into the media centers, we have to communicate this information to everybody we can, we have to be, let our voices be heard in the great uh, in, in the great power centers of society, the political parties, the labor unions, the church organizations, the media centers, and so forth. This is where we, the 3% or less, must go to work. This is where we're going to find the battle. This is where we're going to engage the enemy. And this is where we're going to recapture all the respective countries of the world.